The global elite rely on a number of organizations to push their agenda. Many of us know about the work of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, and a handful of others. The Tavistock Institute for Human Relations is included and instrumental in this collection of subversive organizations. However, we rarely if ever hear about its role in mass brainwashing and shaping of public opinion. As I covered in a previous episode, the elite are active on several fronts to reduce world population and basically turn the planet into a lockdown, high-tech prison where a demoralized and reduced population is completely under the iron-fisted rule of a world government. This long-term agenda would not be possible without first conditioning and brainwashing populations into accepting and even celebrating their loss of freedom and servitude. The control agenda of the Tavistock Institute was first exposed in 1969 by author and researcher John Coleman. His monograph, The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, Shaping the Moral, Cultural, Political, and Economic Decline of the United States of America, revealed deep connections between this organization and the ruling elite. Tavistock emerged in 1921 at the Wellington House in England. This seemingly innocuous name served as a cover for Britain's War Propaganda Bureau. David Lloyd George, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was given the task of setting up a British War Propaganda Bureau. George appointed the writer and fellow Liberal MP Charles Masterman to head the organization. Members included H.G. Wells and Rudyard Kipling. A number of writers were put to work cranking out pro-war propaganda to promote and demand participation in the so-called Great War, now known as the First World War. According to Coleman, the Tavistock Institute at Sussex University in London is owned and controlled by the Royal Institute for International Affairs, also known as the Chatham House. This is the epicenter of the British establishment. Its meetings are secret, like those held by the Bilderberg Group. The Royal Institute for International Affairs is said to be based on the King Arthur myths. Financial backers of this organization included the Astor family. Its American equivalent, the Council on Foreign Relations, was funded by J.P. Morgan, Jacob Schiff, Paul Warburg, John D. Rockefeller, and others. The Wellington House role in the effort to manipulate both British and American citizens and demand their unwavering support for mass murder and sacrifice was headed up by the Viscount Baron Rothermere and Alfred Charles William Harmsworth, the first Viscount of Northcliffe. Northcliffe was essential to the brainwashing project. He owned the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror newspapers. Rothermere was the chairman of the Daily Mail and General Trust. According to Coleman's research, Tavistock received its funding from the British royal family and later the Rothschilds, to whom Lord Northcliffe was related through marriage. It also received funding from the Rockefeller Family Trusts and the Milner Group. The royal family played an instrumental role in guiding the agenda, according to Coleman's research. At least two Americans were involved in this project of mass manipulation of the public, Walter Lippmann and Edward Bernays. Lippmann, who would later introduce the concept of Cold War, was a notable member of the Council on Foreign Relations, established in 1921. 
He played a significant role in the Woodrow Wilson decision to get the United States involved in the war in Europe, despite having promised not to. Edward Bernays, known as the father of spin, was a master propagandist and public relations wizard. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays called the effort to brainwash the public psychological warfare. In 1937, Tavistock based its operations on German philosopher Oswald Spengler's book, The Decline of the West. Spengler argued the West is in rapid decline and ruled by what he called Caesarism, the state's prerogative of violence. Spengler said humanity would ultimately return to a more animalistic state, a sort of advanced primitivism. Spengler's analysis is hardly a match for the Tavistock agenda implemented by the elite, the British royal family, and globalist One World organizations. Tavistock took what it wanted from Spengler, the theory, civilization is doomed and must be replaced with a different system. Not the primitivist social utopia imagined by Spengler, but rather a one-world globalist totalitarian government set on reducing population and controlling all aspects of society. At its core, Spengler's thesis holds that alien hordes will arrive in America in increasing numbers, thus leading to a fall of Western civilization and its culture, law, and ethics. This legacy is linked to the Roman Empire and medieval Western Christendom that emerged from the Middle Ages to experience a number of transformative episodes such as the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and the advancement of scientific knowledge. In Europe, large numbers of Africans, Arabs, and others are flooding the continent, resulting in social and political chaos, as two widely different cultures clash. This highly disruptive force has resulted in severe political polarization and the rise of nationalist groups opposed to continued immigration and asylum status. Wellington House Board members Rothmere, Northcliffe, Lipman, and Bernays also praised a book by Correa Molin Walsh. The Climax of Civilization, published in 1917. Walsh argues civilization has reached the end of its centuries-long use of natural resources and is plagued by irreversible social and moral decline. The author discusses topics that would later be taken up by the Club of Rome. The massive propaganda effort undertaken by Tavistock during the First World War went into overdrive in the United States. By far, most Americans opposed entering the war, and Tavistock and others worked to change this. In Britain, it only took a couple of years of relentless media propaganda to turn the British people from opponents of the war into enthusiastic advocates and participants. The same model was used to get the United States into the war. Propaganda warps perception and introduces new terms to demonize a shifting array of opponents. For instance, in America, the Tavistock propaganda effort labeled war opponents as isolationists, a term that would later be used by Roosevelt to manipulate the nation into fighting the Second World War.
propaganda portrayed isolationism, which is in actuality peaceful and mutually beneficial relations, and aversion to becoming entangled in the affairs of other nations, as nothing short of treason. At the time, President Wilson preached the idea of a one-world government. He managed to lower, if not destroy, tariffs that protected the American economy and worker. This so-called free trade, now center to the globalist ideology, resulted in American workers and companies being displaced and ruined by foreign trade. Most notably, British products that were made in India by cheap labor and exported to the United States. In order to make up for this lost tariff income, the U.S. passed the Federal Income Tax Law in 1913, thus passing the responsibility to pay for the lavish spending habits of professional politicians and their benefactors, that is to say corporations and banks. As Coleman notes, this mandatory taxation is a Marxist concept not included in the Constitution. Wilson's lowering and removal of tariffs eventually resulted in the creation of globalist trade agreements under NAFTA, GATT, and the World Trade Organization. These trade agreements between governments and transnational corporations have resulted in dismantling the middle class, a key objective of Tavistock and its globalist supporters. Ushered in by Bill Clinton and his wife, not only displaced and impoverished American workers, it also produced a destructive effect on Mexican agricultural and small business operations, which in turn helped produce a surge of illegal aliens crossing the border in search of work and handouts by the state. In addition, this supposed free trade agreement provided a mechanism for large corporations to invest in China's growing economy. In return, China was allowed to access American markets. This further displaced workers who were unable to compete with what amounts to slave labor in China. Tavistock and the Wellington House also pushed for the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, the same year an income tax was forced on the American people. The destruction of the U.S. economy and the gradual impoverishment of the American middle class would not have been possible without the creation of the Federal Reserve, which controls and manipulates the money supply to benefit the 0.1% through ongoing upward distribution of wealth. Both Lippmann and Bernays were involved in this banker cartel consolidation of wealth and assets. They established the National Citizens League, a rather transparent oxymoron, under the direction of Samuel Untermeyer, a prominent New York lawyer who pushed the Federal Reserve Act and associated legislation, including the Clayton Bill. Before the Federal Reserve Act could be signed by Wilson, it was gone over with a fine-tooth comb by Colonel Edward Mandel House and the British oligarchy represented by the banker J.P. Morgan. In 1957, Dr. William Sargent of the Tavistock Institute, who reportedly worked in tandem with the CIA on its MK Ultra brainwashing experiments at the time, wrote a book with an improbable title, Battle for the Mind, A Physiology of Conversion and Brainwashing, How Evangelists, Psychiatrists, Politicians, and Medicine Men Can Change Your Beliefs and Behavior. Sargent explains how alien beliefs can be implanted in the human brain through induced fear, anger, and excitement. He writes that of the results caused by such disturbances, the most common is temporarily impaired judgment and heightened suggestibility. Mm -hmm. 
This results in what psychologists call herd instinct, and it is most prevalent during war, epidemics, and all similar periods of common danger, which increase anxiety and opens up the individual to mass suggestibility. Jim Keith, the author of Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness, describes Tavistock as a collaborative effort of British military intelligence and the psychiatric establishment. Keith writes that Tavistock's influence reaches the mass corporate media, corporations, governments, and the psychiatric establishment. Coleman has said the moral, spiritual, racial, economic, cultural, and intellectual bankruptcy we are now in the midst of today is the product of a carefully planned Tavistock program. In 1928, Bernays wrote in his book Propaganda that the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of the country. This legacy of lies and manipulation in the name of war and a totalitarian world government is alive and well today. Every day we are slammed with fake news guiding us along a prearranged path toward our ultimate enslavement and the prospect of never-ending war and conflict. I believe we are heading into a new war, the ultimate conflict. The final push to have us accept, either through directed propaganda or physical violence by the state, a suicidal showdown between the U.S., Russia, and China. If we survive this engineered war, we will all be swept into bondage. For as Henry Kissinger so aptly noted, if the orchestrated crisis, or a number of them piled one upon the other, are effective, the American people will run to the state and beg for protection.